Hello everyone, and welcome to Let's Play Choice of Robots. My name is Alpha Pi Omega, and today I will be your host. So Choice of Robots is basically a digital game book made by Choice of Games, a company I am a big fan of, and that's definitely worth checking out. Now, for those of you who don't know what a game book is, it's basically a book with a set of situations that are marked under each numbers, and depending on your actions, it branches into different conclusions. So, Choice of Robots is this made for computer, and it has a whooping 300,000 words in it. So we are in for a treat. Now these games play basically as a text reading sort of game. So for those of you that do not like that, I bid you farewell. And for those, for those of you that like a good book and a good story, welcome, sit down, grab a cup of coffee and join me for this one. So, choice of robots. Where are you? We have four options. In the court of the Egyptian god Anubis answering for my sins, on a war-torn battlefield with a robotic statue of liberty, on a cliff in Ireland watching the sunset with a robot companion, or on a utopian beach ruled by a godlike cloud of robots. Well, Choice of Robots is a scientific novel, and it is about an engineer, I believe, a, a robot engineer, which is you. I guess uh, we're gonna go with in the court of the Egyptian god Anubis answering for my sins. You see a robotic Anubis, jackal-headed guardian of the Egyptian underworld, seated on a throne of a gold-edged silicon in a half in a hall of a dark glass. He holds scales on which he weights a clockwork heart against a silicon brain. Tell me your sins, robot maker, Anubis says. Well, in life I created robots that could think but not feel, and so they turned turned against us. Interesting. Or I made a robot to love me unconditionally, but never offered love in kind. Oh, that's so sad. Some AI intelligence right there. Or your scales balance because I gave my robots neither heart nor minds. My minions obeyed me without questions as I conquered Alaska. <laughs> wow. This is a tough one. I guess... Um, in life I created robots that could think but not feel, and so they turned against us. Wow, e each of these is, uh, is not really good for me, but I'm I'll go with the first one. The scales tip towards the brain, plus free autonomy. Yes, you value the intelligence of your robots above their kindness, Anubis said. Look to the glass and remember your sins. The dark glass behind him shimmers, and a vision appears in it. A gang of humanoid robots is moving from room to room in a hospital, destroying any equipment they come across. When they find the infant ward, containing rows and rows of infant cribs, one robot turns to another. As I told you, says the robot, it is optimal to fight the humans when they are least able to defend themselves. I cannot fold your computations, says the second robot. They raise their claw-like grippers and approach the infants. The vision fades. I will send you back to relive your life, Anubis says, but remember that intelligence without mercy is a dangerous thing. Chapter 1. The Assembly. Some things are in our control and others not. Epictetus. Okay, so we have went through the prologue and now are entering the first chapter. You awaken with your head on a desktop keyboard. Your 3D drafting program is still open. The schematic zoomed in to the recess where your smartphone will snap into its back to act as its brain. You recall fiddling with that part endlessly last night until finally your vision began to fade. There was a roaring in your ears and you realized that you had been working far, far too long. You must have passed out. 
It's the fall of 2019. You're a 24-year-old graduate student in the PhD program in computer science at Stanford, and you're a guy whose name is... Um, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, here, I'll type it for you. Uh, Rudolf, which is my name. Rudolf, is that right? Yes. And your last name is... <laughs> Uh, we'll go with Calvin, Rudolf Calvin, that sounds scientific enough. You look around your apartment, what does it look like? My BattleBots trophy is perched on a widescreen TV equipped with the latest video game consoles. Need to label plastic shelving units sit on a 3D printer equipped ro robot workbench, or busts of famous philosophers sit next to my own attempts to sculpt them. <laughs> Or my shelves display all of the strange with the robotic creatures I have made over these. Oh, I like the last one. You've always been fascinated with the idea of creating artificial life. You've got at least 20 such creations on your shelves. The construction materials, a timeline of your life. The earliest is made of toothpicks and glue. The latest, a spider robot you made out of your old smartphone when your planning gave you a new one. Your creations often confuse people. Who don't get that robots don't have to be for anything? When people pick up your free like free legged wall climbing robot that sings when it detects encrypted wireless packets, they ask, What the heck is that for? And you reply, What's anything for? What are you for? Okay, maybe you don't say that, but you sometimes think it. <laughs> plus two autonomy. Okay, so we're at plus five autonomy. You can show stats. Humanity ninety percent. Uh, relationships, empathy, oh you can see, autonomy 5 in beta, military 1 buggy, empathy 1 buggy, grace 1 buggy. Okay, cool, gender male, fame, who, love, zero, broke, romance, none. Cool. It strikes you for a moment that this kind of thinking about how your life affects your robots is second nature to you, though others might find it peculiar. You've always been fascinated by how every little detail of your life, from the content of your dreams to the decor of your room, changes the inputs to the robots you create, boosts their empathy, or autonomy, or grace, or appeals to the military. Surely, there are other things going on around you as a result of your decisions, but they don't immediately strike you in the same way. Today, your robot is foremost on your mind because you're about to build its body. You pick up your laptop and head for the Stanford machine shop. It's a beautiful spring day in Palo Alto, California, and your apartment is only a short walk from the machine shop. But the streets of Palo Alto are not designed for walking. You find yourself climbing around palm trees and balancing on the narrow curbs as you do every day. You hear a low roar overhead. Glazing up, you see it's a flying car, a Nimbus. A little over $300,000 can buy you a car with wings that fold out, so that it becomes a small sport plane. The red Nimbus looks sleek and sporty. It's a sort of a car its owner takes religiously to the car wash. Though the commercials would have you believe you can fly anywhere you want in those cars, the FAA still requires them to take off and land from airports. Only here in wealthy Silicon Valley do you see them with any frequency. The first time you saw one, you couldn't quite believe the future had arrived so quickly. But the second time you saw one, you thought, I will own one of those one day, I swear. Or if I ever make that much money, I will use it to help the world instead of buying that car. Or why aren't those flying cars driving themselves? Uh, I guess the third one. Occasionally, you can see a self-driving car on the roads of Palo Alto, but for some reason, they still haven't caught on quite as much as one would expect, despite having been around at least for as long as the flying cars. If you decide it is because people just don't trust self-driving cars enough, it's important to make your robot seem trustworthy. Intelligence alone doesn't instill trust plus empathy. The Stanford University fabrication shop smells like oil and burnt plastic. The room is dominated by large metal hand-cranked milling machines and lathes, dinosaurs of the 20th century, 
Uh, the most used machines are the smaller 3D printers and computer controlled water jet cutters that take a quarter of the space. The lights have a, the sterile floor sense of an operating room with only a single tiny window near the ceiling to inform you that it is day. You, sta you start up a national public radio podcast on your laptop. You haven't seen your advisor much since you joined the lab, so you choose the episode in which he's the interviewee. My guest today is Dr. Harvey Zingler, says a woman with a soothing voice. Dr. Zingler, thank you for talking with us today. Well, a scientist does have some responsibility to inform the unwashed masses, Terry. You let the podcast run as you walk over to the 3D printers. What material have you decided to use for your robot? Plastic. It may break easily, but it's both life to weight and cheap. Or metal. It's the most resistant to damage. Or wood. is the most pleasing to the hand and eye. Huh. A wooden robot. And we're gonna go with plastic. You walk over to the stack of 3D printer cartridges, unwrap one, and load the large cylinder of meltable plastic into the printer. You often find yourself needing to make little repairs to your robot yourself, and over time the savings from plastic will start to add up, plus wealth. Thermoplastics aren't the best when, they're far, when there's fire nearby though, when it's military. Dr. Ziegler, in your new book, you talk about the singularity. Could you describe for our listeners what that is? Terry, the singularity is the coming time when artificial intelligence will have figured out how to make themselves and us smarter. Once that happens, the process will build on itself until the robots are smart enough to figure out how we can live forever. Is it possible? The interviewer asks. Living forever? Of course, Professor Ziegler says. What does it matter whether our operating systems are made of meat or silicon. So you're predicting we'll become robots? Not exactly, Zinger says, but I do think the line between humans and robots will blur. You're hardly listening to the podca podcasts because you're about to make your first robot part. What does the head of your robot look like? Okay, so a human face as lifelike as I can make it, or a simple box with eyes we're not trying to be anything but a robot. <laughs> oh my god, such an old school thing. It will be felt, covered, and behind, like a puppet, so people will not be afraid of it. Or it will have a ring of cameras around its head for a 360 degree view. Or it will look like a Venetian mask, beautiful, expressionless, and otherworldly. Uh, I'm considering either this one or this one. So either it will be felt covered and big-eyed like a puppet, or it will look like a Venetian mask, beautiful, expressionless, and otherworldly. Uh, we're gonna go with this one. I I really like. Uh, uh, what was she called? Uh, Evie Eva from Volley. So it's something what I'm something like I'm gonna go for. The 3D printer quickly prints the face, the small nose, the dangly mouth. The large buying holes where CCD panels will absorb all the light. It takes somewhat longer to add the intricate plastic frill that adds a corona to the mask. This is a robot that will command all, plus two grace minus empathy. Dr. Ziegler, what makes you think the singularity will happen now? Well, for one thing, I'm around, but seriously, my lab is taking a unique approach because we're saying, why not teach a robot like a child? We're going to equip the robot with the best sensors money can buy and teach it English. Then it could rapidly teach itself using the internet. Well, that's annoying. Your advisor, though, your advisor thought that a robot child was a stupid idea until you told him. <laughs> Turing proposed it back in 1950, minus the internet part. But he isn't giving credit to either of you. You keep working regardless. How will your robot get around? Ah. Uh, it will walk upright on two legs, or it will crawl on eight legs, or it will roll on wheels, it will fly like a helicopter, it will roll on tank threads, or it will walk upright, but will also have the delicate wings it can use for balance. 
Uh, okay, so we have no hover technique, obviously, at this point, so I guess it will walk upright on two legs. When the 3D printer is done with the head, you start the program that produces the torso and queue up the upper and lower legs. You think being bipedal will help your robot get along with humans, though it will also make it easier for a robot to trip and fall. Plus 2 empathy, minus 1 grace. You use the basic hanged, cranked, milling machines to drill holes in the head for screws, since 3D printers aren't the best for threaded holes. And who is going to raise this robot child? The interviewer asked. Who does all the grunt work in a research laboratory? Professor Sigur says. The graduate students, of course. You find yourself wanting to reply to the podcast. It's not grunt work. Education is critical to the robot's development. Or we also do all the real science. <laughs> or perhaps you could learn something from doing a little grunt work yourself, Professor Sigur. Actually, I like the first one. It's not grunt work. Education is critical to the robot's development. Graduate students always overestimate the degree to which teaching actually matters, says Professor Singer, who appears to have entered the machine shop behind you when you weren't looking. If the robot's smart, it will learn no matter what, and if it's not, it won't. <laughs>